Florida boasts an abundance and diversity of fish species throughout its 8,500 miles of coastline. Every fish that swims in our waters proves to be a vital and valuable resource. The management and maintenance of these fisheries remains the sole responsibility of the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, known as FWC. Decisions by the Commission are based on comprehensive scientific investigation conducted by FWC's Fish and Wildlife Research Institute and its satellite laboratories around the state. It is this professional approach on a continuous basis that ensures long-term sustainability of Florida's fisheries and has earned Florida the title of fishing capital of the world. I'm Mark Sosen, a longtime Florida fisherman and a strong supporter of the programs FWC has put in place to protect the great fishing we currently enjoy. Recreational angling adds five to eight billion dollars to Florida's economy each year. It creates countless jobs and lures some two and a half million anglers to our waters. This increased fishing pressure cause to decrease fish populations, as well as habitat. Effective fisheries management begins with quality science. Quality science depends on good data on the fisheries being managed and an understanding of the biology of the fish being harvested. The key lies in recognizing and isolating trends of abundance and mortality as early as possible so that corrective action can be taken. Six major teams of scientists funnel information to the stock assessment group where it is combined and analyzed before being passed along to marine fisheries managers and FWC commissioners for corrective action. These teams of researchers include fisheries independent monitoring, fisheries dependent monitoring, fish biology, which encompasses age, growth, reproduction, and genetics, fish and wildlife health, stock enhancement, and artificial reefs. These scientific programs and facilities rank among the finest in the world. Let's take a closer look at them. Fisheries independent monitoring is a valuable tool relying on random sampling in specific areas selected by computer to analyze the relative abundance, spatial and seasonal distributions, and the habitat use of fish populations. Fisheries independent data are not subject to changes in fishing regulations or supply and demand issues, but are a representation of what's going on in the wild population. Estimates of relative abundance help to predict the availability of a species in the future. It also provides numbers and information needed to assess the effectiveness of management measures once they are enacted and can be used to determine the effects of natural or man-made disturbances, such as oil spills, red tides, and cold water events. Sinopsosilatus. Additional data, including species composition, size, sex, and age, are important when creating and maintaining fishing regulations and assessing individual fish stocks. Data are collected in several ways. In offshore waters, a 45-foot boat is used to collect fish with either a fish trap or hook and line gear. Traditionally, the federal government has uh, used uh, deep water trawls and stuff to sample a lot of fish populations, but reef habitat, of course, reefs are not very friendly with trawls, so you can't sample in those types of areas. That's why we're using gears that's non-invasive, uh, it doesn't damage the habitat, and we can, we can put it down on a specific habitat, take uh, our sample from it, and get out, and it doesn't you know, damage it. For some reef fish research, either scuba divers or stationary underwater cameras are used to conduct visual surveys to identify, count, and estimate the sizes of reef fish species observed. Monitoring inshore waters is usually done using a 70-foot seine or a 20-foot otter troll, 
which typically collects smaller fish within the estuary. A haul seine is a small rectangular net that is pulled and retrieved by hand in shallow water over grass flats and mangrove shorelines. Larger fish of various species are collected using a 600-foot haul seine along shoreline and seagrass shoal habitats with the estuary. Fisheries dependent monitoring focuses on catches by recreational anglers. Fishermen are interviewed at dockside locations or by telephone to generate data on fish species, the number caught, size of the fish, where they were caught, how much effort was expended to catch the fish, and whether each fish was harvested or released. Catch cards are also used. They are filled out by anglers and returned to dependent monitoring. Providing this information to researchers is strictly voluntary rather than mandatory. The data recovered from anglers are extremely valuable in managing marine fisheries resources. Additional monitoring takes place aboard party boats and charter boats. Information gathered includes the species of fish that were caught, the numbers, the location where the catch was made, the length of each fish, and whether it was harvested, released, or tagged and released. The primary task of the Age and Growth Department centers on studying the otoliths, or ear stones of fish, to gather age data. Otoliths form annual rings similar to those in the trunk of a tree. Each year, some 30,000 otoliths are studied by researchers. From the age data, biologists can estimate growth rates, maximum age, age at maturity, and trends for future generations. Age-based stock assessment models allow scientists to estimate mortality and population structure so they can determine longevity of a given species. Otoliths also provide information on where a fish lived as a juvenile and as a mature adult. Marine fisheries biologist Sarah Walters summarizes the importance of age and growth studies. In fisheries management, we have a variety of elements that go into helping us understand the biology of a fish and are we properly managing it with our fishing regulations. So we'll take little bits of information such as how old does a fish live, what does a fish eat, where does it reproduce, how often is it reproducing, the survival of the juveniles, trophic dynamics, all of these elements go into um, the stock assessment, which is a mathematical model. That in turn goes to the managers, and the managers can incorporate the science as well as the needs of the public. Biologists also rely on acoustic telemetry to study an assortment of species, including Goliath grouper, along with the impact of catch and release fishing. This type of research helps to determine habitat use by various species. Fish and wildlife health researchers study fish disease and collect baseline data on marine sport fish. Through this research, they develop health guidelines for stock enhancement and investigate and document wild fish disease and mortality events around the state. These disease monitoring efforts benefit greatly from public reports of abnormal fish or fish kills, so the Fish and Wildlife Health Group maintains the toll-free fish kill hotline. Biologists work with the public and other agencies to respond to and understand the causes of fish kills, which are often the result of poor water quality or harmful algal blooms such as red tide. Such blooms may produce biological toxins that can impact fish health. They also study diseases which can be caused by fungal bacterial, viral or parasitic infections. Usually parasites uh, of marine fishes don't cause disease in wild fish. Uh, it's something that we expect to find in wild fish. People see them sometimes and they're pretty concerned that they're seeing a significant disease. But generally speaking, a low number of many different types of parasites is a good thing. It says something good about the environment. And go. Stock assessment is totally dependent on the information being fed into the decision-making team. To be successful, science must combine data from studies of the ecosystem with continued investigations species by species. Currently, 
48 species of fish are measured on a continuous basis through stock assessment, with another 90 species and groups looked at regularly. Florida has been a leader in stock assessment for many years with analysis skills that continue to improve constantly. Conserving the qualities of our fisheries. The stock assessment team relies on the best science available. With increased fishing pressure coupled with the loss of habitat, their work in maintaining viable fish populations becomes even more important. Stock enhancement, along with the artificial reef program, make valuable contributions to stock assessment by supplying vital information. Let's take a closer look. The Florida Hatchery Program provides fish production, outreach, and education for the public and aquatic plants for coastal habitat restoration. It's an important addition to marine fisheries research. The Stock Enhancement Program uses applied research to develop technology for breeding and rearing finfish and mollusks to enhance and rebuild coastal fisheries. Species that have been bred and reared include red drum, snook, bay scallops, and queen conch, with primary focus on red drum. Science and technology are being used to raise hatchling red drum, which are then released into Florida waters to supplement the natural population. During the 1980s, redfish were under considerable fishing pressure from both recreational and commercial interests. That's when Florida built a 54-acre fish hatchery in Port Manatee to develop and evaluate stock enhancement as a means of enhancing sport fish populations. A series of ponds were created where fish could be raised to three different sizes before being stocked into coastal waters. The process started by collecting mature red drum from brood stock from the field. These fish were returned to the hatchery and placed in tanks where researchers could control water temperature, the amount of daylight, and other factors so the fish would spawn in captivity. At the time of the spawn, the eggs are collected and counted before being placed in incubators where they hatch and develop into first feeding larvae in three days. Chris Young, research administrator at the Stock Enhancement Facility, describes the feeding process. The rearing process is pretty much similar in ponds or in tanks. We basically are uh, providing live feeds to the first feeding larvae, and then over time, we're transitioning those fish to an artificial diet uh, to grow them to larger target uh, sizes. Before being released, fish batches are identified genetically and, depending on fish size, are marked with internal coated wire tags so that researchers could determine if the stocking was successful and if the stocking strategies are effective. Prior to release, an independent veterinarian examines a fish sample from each stocking group to make sure that hatchery fish are healthy and free from parasites to prevent harm to wild stocks. For 25 years, fish were raised in outside ponds at the hatchery, but now the latest technology makes it possible to raise them indoors in tanks. Researchers are currently developing and refining the intensive fish culture process. Researchers want to make sure hatchery fish are healthy and determine the best time of year and the best habitat to stock them. Through fisheries independent and dependent monitoring along with aquatic health and genetics, some of these fish are recaptured in the wild, identified, and their movements tracked to see if they are intermingling with wild stocks. Aquatic health helps to monitor the health of these fish while genetics collects tissue and can identify the broodstock parent's DNA as it relates to the stocked fingerlings. This provides a viable way to track the fish in the field. Coastal marshes form vital habitat for many species of marine fish at some stage of their life. 
The hatchery has created an affluent treatment marsh. Chris Young explains its purpose. Behind me is our effluent marsh for the hatchery. Uh, it is, we have placed seedlings of Aspartina altinoflora, which is common cord grass. It's a common marsh species throughout Florida and coastal areas. And these plants are removing nutrients from our hatchery effluent so that we will have less of an impact on the environment. These aquatic plants are harvested from the treatment marsh for coastal restoration throughout the Tampa Bay watershed and groups like the Southwest Water Management District, Manatee County Parks and Recreation, and Tampa Bay Watch all benefit by the availability of Spartina for habitat restoration. Spartina is harvested from the hatchery treatment marsh to create or restore marshes in coastal areas where there may have been hurricane damage or habitat destruction. Since 1997, the stock enhancement facility has provided over 1 million plugs and 300,000 single stem shoots for coastal habitat restoration. Future plans call for expanding the operation to produce different grass species for restoration. The outreach and education program plays an integral role in the stock enhancement research facility. The challenge of keeping our fisheries healthy and strong is shared between the dedicated scientists who work diligently to monitor and manage our fish stocks and recreational anglers who are on the scene fisheries managers. Tours are provided for school groups and angling clubs, tailored to educate the visitors to the benefits of stock enhancement. It also makes them aware of habitat restoration and the importance of the right habitat for the fish. Each visitor is encouraged to help protect the marine environment and conserve our marine resources. Displays with live fish in tanks are provided for various outdoor shows around the state to help make anglers aware of their responsibilities. Environmental specialist Gina Russo heads this program and points out one of the features at the hatchery. I'm standing in front of our hatchery detention pond. This is the pond in which school group tours and angling clubs can have a special opportunity to catch different marine sport fish such as red drum, common snook, and spotted sea trout. These are the three most sought after sport fish in Florida. It also teaches these anglers how to be stewards of our marine environment. The artificial reef program provides vital information to the critical task of stock assessment. Let's take a look underwater. The Artificial Reef Program of the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission works toward enhancing marine recreational fishing opportunities and promoting proper management of fisheries resources for the public interest. An artificial reef is created when natural or man-made objects are intentionally placed on the seafloor to sustain and enhance the spawning, feeding, and growth of various fish species. By providing habitat and concentrating populations of different fishes, artificial reefs offer a mecca for both the recreational angler and the sport diver. They also play an essential role in fisheries research and are sometimes used for fisheries conservation and preservation purposes. Plus. With some 3,000 reef sites in state and federal waters of 34 coastal counties, Florida has one of the most active and successful reef programs in the nation. Everything from bridge rubble to specially designed concrete structures to retired naval and commercial vessels has been intentionally sunk in carefully selected locations. More than 1,000 of these artificial reef sites are used primarily for research and the coordinates of their locations are not given to the public. 
Unlike other states where all permits for artificial reefs are held by marine fisheries management agencies, Florida's reef program represents a long-standing cooperative partnership with various coastal governments. Local coastal governments hold the permits and accept the liability for compliance with permit requirements. Their artificial reef coordinators team up with local fishing and diving interests to develop, manage, and monitor artificial reefs in the area. Funding comes from three primary sources. Monies generated from saltwater fishing license sales, grants from the Federal Sport Fish Restoration Program, and contributions from local governments all help to support artificial reef projects. One of several major goals of the FWC Artificial Reef Program is to do no harm to the marine environment, fishery resources, or human health. The reef program does not interfere with other traditional and acceptable uses of the marine environment. It does not create navigational hazards, nor does it damage other types of essential fish habitat. Its primary purpose focuses on supporting FWC's efforts to ensure sustainability of healthy fish and wildlife populations for their long-term well-being and benefit to the people. There are currently three allowable artificial reef materials categories in Florida. Design prefabricated artificial reef modules are specifically engineered and assembled to meet life history and behavioral requirements of certain marine fish and invertebrates. These units are typically clean concrete or some form of steel, concrete, and limestone. A second category is locally quarried natural rock, and the third category involves materials originally used for an unrelated purpose. These include clean steel reinforced concrete bridge material, precast concrete structures, and heavy gauge steel materials. All three categories of reef materials must not harm human health or the marine environment and possess the stability and durability to remain in place at the assigned depth for at least 20 years without movement, including during severe storms. The FWC Artificial Reef Program is not one of dump and hope. Every artificial reef project offers specific and explicit methods of construction before funding is obtained. This professional approach is designed to use the best management practices based on the latest available science, reef monitoring, and assessment feedback. The project objective must be defined in the context of the acronym SMART, which stands for Specific, Manageable, Achievable, Relevant, and Time Bound. Reef site selection must include awareness of other human activity in the area, the existing subsurface ocean landscape, navigational clearance issues, and impacts on threatened and endangered species. The three main factors in reef placement are location, location, location. The reef manager must be aware of the types of substrate and seafloor communities in the vicinity, as well as the physical oceanographic factors such as sea temperature, currents, salinity, visibility, and so forth. When artificial reefs are designed and developed, there must be a means of monitoring the degree of success in the achievement of the original objectives. This is why monitoring of artificial reefs centers on compliance as well as performance. Artificial reefs constructed to serve fishing and diving enhancements with socioeconomic benefits may not simultaneously be able to achieve the objective of fisheries conservation. However, creation of a popular fishing reef is also a legitimate goal. FWC promotes a professionally run, science-based artificial reef program with enough diversity to allow for the accomplishment of a number of different objectives. Through the use of unpublished and unpublicized reef sites where fishing pressure is minimal, scientists can find answers to managing both artificial and natural reefs. 
These unadvertised sites also help to conserve fish species and enable populations to expand. Behaviorally, reef species do not distinguish between natural and artificial reef structures. Artificial reefs often have higher quality and more complex or extensive habitat than some natural reefs, which tends to draw fish to them. Research shows that fish feeding in the water column above the reef, directly on the reef, or in habitat adjacent to the reef, increase in size and weight. Constant monitoring shows that some species remain on a given artificial reef for years, while others will spend a time and then move to another location. Still others may leave a reef for a while and then return to spawn or for other reasons. The concept that if you build it, meaning artificial reefs, they will come, does not always hold true. With all of the artificial reefs in state and nearby federal waters off the coast of Florida from a depth of a few feet to over 400 feet, they add up to less than 1% of the hard bottom and natural reefs in the area. These reefs and the use they receive are factored into fisheries management decisions and their use as a potential fisheries management tool must be considered. The success of artificial reefs is measured by the amount of valuable data they generate for fisheries managers as well as what the reefs contribute to Florida's coastal fisheries. Florida's artificial reef program ranks as a rousing success and a pace-setting partnership with coastal agencies. It has enhanced the recreational fishing potential and provided unparalleled sport diving opportunities. Both of these benefits attract residents and visitors to our shores, making their experiences exciting and memorable. Coastal communities enjoy the economic rewards of having artificial reefs in their home waters. Florida has always taken a leadership role in the management of our saltwater fisheries, fisheries research, and extensive outreach and education efforts to keep our anglers informed and provide outstanding opportunities on the water. These programs, along with our laboratories, rank among the finest and most professional in the world, generating invaluable data to provide management with the information necessary to develop a hands-on approach to protecting our fish stocks and habitat. Because Florida is surrounded by oceans and boasts more than 500 native species of saltwater fish, this protective approach to fisheries management is crucial to the sustainability of marine resources. Success or failure of this vision for tomorrow and massive undertaking to ensure the conservation of fish stocks for decades to come remains in your hands. If each of us thinks about the future of Florida's fisheries, every day we're on the water and every time we catch a fish, tomorrow will be bright and everyone will be able to enjoy the fishing for years to come that has made Florida the fishing capital of the world.